Welcome back to another Serial Killer Saturday. This week's feature was a request by Miss Tudor Rose. Of these lovely gentlemen here, and I use the term gentlemen very loosely. William Burke and William Hare, hard-working Irish emigrants by day, scheming murderers by night. These two were a unique pair of criminals who made a profit from providing dead bodies to the anatomy students of 19th century Edinburgh. Edinburgh's population of university students and practicing anatomists created a unique market for fresh corpses. That prompted Burke and Hare to enter into a illegal trade. Acting on a strict code of no questions asked, the financial rewards of Burke and Hare's crimes led to a series of 16 murders, spanning a period of just under a year. And had the two criminals not allowed their greed to consume them, they may have never been caught. In early 19th century Britain, the law stated that only the bodies of executed criminals could be used for autopsy purposes. But with the ever-growing popularity of anatomy studies, the demand for fresh corpses soon outstripped the supply, and grave robbing became common practice among criminals who wanted to earn an easy pound. Murder for money is not an original concept by any means, but Burke and Hare had a new perspective on killing for financial gain. Unusually, they had little interest in the wealth of their victims. All they needed was a fresh corpse to sell. Burke and Hare are reported to have first met in Edinburgh after both men had left their native Ireland to work on the Union Canal in Scotland. However, it was not until Burke moved from Leith to Westport with his partner Helen MacDougall that he and Hare actually met. Hare had settled at a boarding lodge with a recently widowed woman named Margaret. The two had struck up a relationship soon after her husband's death, and they ran the lodge as if they were a married couple. After a chance meeting, it was Margaret who introduced Helen and Burke to her partner, and the couple soon became paying lodgers. The two couples were never the best of friends, but their love for drinking and easy money-making schemes made them a murderous match. Ultimately, their real dislike for one another will lead to their downfall. In 1827, one of Hare's lodgers, an old man named Donald, fell ill and died. His death was of no real concern to Hare, except Donald owed him four dollars in rent. Such was Hare's anger that he began to consider how the dead man could pay off his debt. Aware of the demand for corpses by anatomists, Hare hatched a plan. On the day of the funeral, Burke and Hare took Donald's body from the coffin and replaced it with a sack of bark. Later in the day, they removed the body from the house and took it to the anatomy offices of Professor Robert Knox. They were asked to return after nightfall, and on doing so, they were paid seven pounds, ten shillings for their effort. This ready cash made the pair contemplate a risky, but ultimately effortless, 
money-making scheme. Grave robbing was labor-intensive, and the quality or freshness of a corpse was not guaranteed. However, committing the murder themselves would be an easy way to ensure the supply of fresh, quality corpses for sale. They didn't have to look very far for their first victim. Another of Hare's lodgers, a miller named Joseph, had fallen ill not long after Donald's death. Though he was not seriously ill, Burke and Hare took it upon themselves to put an end to his suffering. How thoughtful. After several glasses of whiskey with the two men, Joseph passed out, and by holding his nose and mouth closed whilst the other restrained him, Burke and Hare had, by chance, discovered their very own signature murder method. By suffocating the victim, they provided the anatomy students with the fresh, undamaged cadavers that they needed. From then on, their victims ranged from sickly lodgers to old prostitutes, and in the first four months of 1828, their killings were limited to nameless individuals that would cause no questions to be asked. However, in April 1828, local prostitutes Mary Patterson and Janet Brown were out drinking and met up with Burke. He invited them back to his brothers, where they continued to drink. While Mary slept off her excessive drinking, an argument broke out, causing Janet to leave. She told Burke that she would return for Mary later and went to visit her old landlady, Mrs. Lowry. After relaying the morning's events to her old friend, Mrs. Lowry became seriously concerned for Mary's safety and told Janet to return for her at once. A servant accompanied Janet to the Burks, but on arrival, they were told that both Burke and Mary had gone out. Janet insisted on waiting at the lodgings and asked the servant to return to Mrs. Lowry and tell her the news. Still suspicious of the whole affair, Mrs. Lowry sent the servant straight back to the Burks and suggested that Janet must leave. By this time, Mary's body was already on the way to Dr. Knox, but thanks to Mrs. Lowry's warning, Janet had escaped a similar fate. Following Mary and Janet's visit to the Burke's house, the next five victims were deliberately chosen so that they wouldn't be recognized by the students and the local community. And it was around this time that the two couples fell out. Burke accused Hare of supplying Knox with bodies behind his back, and it was agreed that Helen and Burke would move out on their return from visiting Helen's relatives. Once they returned, Burke and Hare's greed and apparent laziness drove them to kill much closer to home. This time, they picked Anne McDougall, a relative of Helen's, who was lured to the lodging house and killed. Whilst Burke had no qualms about Anne's final demise, he did ask Hare to carry out the killing. Carelessly, their next three victims were central to the local community and therefore easily recognized by the paying students who attended Dr. Knox's classes. Mary Haldane was an aging local prostitute who agreed to partake of a dram at Hare's lodgings 
On being told that her mother had been seen with hair, Mary's daughter Peggy decided to pay his lodgings a visit. On arrival, Hare said that Mary had visited but had left. He then invited in Peggy for a drink, and before long, she joined her mother at Dr. Knox's. Both bodies fetched ten pounds each. The neighborhood grew suspicious at these disappearances. Mary and Peggy were familiar faces, but the risk-taking didn't end there. Known as Daft Jamie, James Wilson was a local entertainer and extremely popular with children, easily recognized by his deformed foot. He caused quite a stir at Dr. Knox's class, yet despite several inquiries, Dr. Knox strongly denied that the body was that of James Wilson. The events proceeding their final killing undoubtedly led to the downfall of Burke and Hare, and had their new lodgers, James and Anne Gray, been of a similar moral disposition, they may have joined the foursome in their criminal careers. Mary Dougherty met with Burke by chance on the morning of Halloween, 1828. Having convinced her that their mothers were related, she returned to the lodgings with Burke for a drink. Burke offered her a room, and the Greys were moved out and given a room at the Hare's. Late that night, after drinking and dancing, the Burke's neighbors claimed they heard arguments at the Burke's and a voice calling, Murder. They set off in search of a policeman, but having no luck and hearing no more shouting, they decided to go home. The next morning, the Greys returned to the lodgings to find Mary gone. Helen claimed that she had been overly friendly towards Burke, and they had kicked her out. In truth, Mary was yet to leave the building as her body was laid under the spare bed and covered in straw. During the day, Anne approached the spare room and was sternly warned to stay away. Suspicious of why Burke would be so defensive, James and Anne waited until they were alone in the house and after a brief investigation, they found Mary's body. The Greys immediately confronted Helen, who panicked and offered them ten pounds a week to keep quiet. The Greys refused and left the house to get a policeman. Burke and Helen were taken to the police station for questioning, and when interviewed separately, their stories didn't match up. At the same time, an anonymous tip led the police to Dr. Knox's classrooms. Mary Dougherty's body was found and later identified by James Gray. The Hares were also arrested, and slowly the police began to uncover the real reason for the sudden disappearances in Westport. Unsurprisingly, none of the four had the chance to go over their story, and Burke blamed Hare for the murders, claiming he knew nothing of what had been happening. After a month of indecision, the police offered Hare immunity if he testified against Burke and Helen, and on agreement, Burke and Helen were charged with Mary Dougherty's murder and Burke with the murders of James Wilson and Mary Patterson. The trial began on Christmas Eve, 1828. Both the Hares testified against the Burks, and several witnesses told of victims they had seen with Helen or Burke 
prior to their disappearance. On Christmas morning, after just 50 minutes of consideration by the jury, Burke was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging, and Helen was freed. During the month between Burke's sentencing and his execution, he made two thorough confessions, detailing 16 murders that he and Hare had committed, though the order was inconsistent. Contrary to popular belief, Burke and Hare were not infamous grave robbers. In fact, there is no proof to suggest they ever robbed a single grave. Hare was released in February 1829, and many popular tales tell of him as a blind beggar on the streets of London, having been mobbed and thrown in a lime pit. However, none of these reports were ever confirmed. The last known sighting of him was in the English town of Carlisle. Helen traveled south, but she never managed to escape her past. According to rumor, she moved to Australia, where she died in 1868. Margaret is believed to have returned to Ireland, though like Helen, she was mobbed wherever she went. It should also be noted that after Burke was hanged, he was publicly dissected at the Edinburgh Medical College. The dissecting professor, Alexander Munro, dipped his quill pen into Burke's blood and wrote, This is written with the blood of William Burke, who was hanged at Edinburgh. This blood was taken from his head. His skeleton, death mask, and items made from his tanned skin are displayed at the college's museum, including the book you see in this picture here. I hope you all enjoyed Serial Killer Saturday, and if you have any requests or suggestions, Contact me through any of my social media, or leave a message or comment here. See you next time. Welcome to Serial Killer Saturday. What makes a serial killer? Is it trauma? Is it a childhood filled with horrible events that inspire them? Is it the chemical makeup of the brain? Are there predetermined genetic traits that no matter the environment would allow the urge to kill to manifest? Or is it a combination of all of them? If you could find out what creates a monster? Could you not also stop a monster from ever being made? A serial killer is defined as a person who commits a series of murders, often with no apparent motive and typically following a characteristic, predictable behavior pattern. As this series progresses, you will see with your own eyes and learn as you listen along that serial killers have no specific gender, no specific ethnic background, no specific age, no specific region. The only thing that they have in common is the drive to kill. Carl Eugene Watts, a.k.a. Coral a.k.a. the Sunday Morning Slasher. Number of victims, between 22 and more than 100. Date of murders, 1974 through 1982. Carl Eugene Watts, 
was born on November 7, 1953, in Killeen, Texas, to Richard Eugene Watts and Dorothy May Young. His father was a private first class in the Army, and his mother was a kindergarten art teacher. When Watts was less than two years of age, his parents separated, and he was raised by his mother. Watts and his mother moved to Inkster, Michigan, and in 1962, Dorothy May married a mechanic named Norman Caesar, with whom she had two daughters. As a child, Watts was described as being strange. Around the age of 12, Watts claimed that this is when he started to fantasize about torturing and killing girls and young women. During adolescence, Watts began to stalk girls and is believed to have killed his first victim before the age of 15. When Watts was 13, he was infected with meningitis, which caused him to be held back in the eighth grade. Upon his return to school, Watts had difficulty keeping up with the other students. At school, he would often receive failing grades and was reading at a third grade level by the age 16. He also suffered severe bullying at school. On June 29, 1969, Watts was arrested for sexually assaulting 26-year-old Joan Gave. When Watts was tried, he was sentenced to the Lafayette Clinic, a mental hospital in Detroit. According to a psychiatric assessment, Watts was revealed to have a full-scale IQ of 68 and to have delusional thought process. Though a police officer interrogating Watts after his arrest later stated that he appeared to be very, very intelligent with an excellent memory. He was released from the Lafayette Clinic on November 9, 1969. Despite his poor grades, Watts graduated from high school in 1973 and received a football scholarship to Lane College in Jackson, Tennessee. He was expelled from Lane College after only three months because he was accused of stalking and assaulting women. Another reason he was expelled was because many people at Lane College believed Watts was a suspect in the brutal murder of a female student. However, there was not enough evidence to convict him of the murder. After his expulsion, he moved to Houston, Texas. Watts' career as a serial killer began when he was 20 years old in 1974. By kidnapping his victims from their homes, torturing them, and then murdering them. On October 30th, 1974, Watts tortured and brutally murdered 20-year-old Gloria Steele, who was believed to be his second victim. Watts, who was African-American, almost always killed young white women. Watts killed females between the ages of 14 and 44, using methods such as strangulation, stabbing, bludgeoning, and drowning. Watts had murdered dozens of women between 1974 and 1982, and despite the many women he murdered, Watts was not discovered as a serial killer for almost eight years. There were several reasons for this. He attacked in several different jurisdictions and even different states. Even with the advent of DNA testing, it was still nearly impossible because he rarely performed sexual acts on his victims. Unlike most serial killers of all women and girls, his crimes were not thought to be sexually motivated. 
Watts was also not suspected to be involved with any of the murders by the people who knew him and was not a police suspect in any of the murders until his arrest in 1982. On May 23, 1982, Watts was arrested for breaking into the home of two young women in Houston and attempting to kill them. Watts had spotted a woman leaving a Houston nightclub and followed her home. Michelle Madej was killed on her 20th birthday and her body was dumped into a bathtub. Then Watts moved on to another apartment complex where he would confront his last two victims. The following is a quote from Melinda Aguilar. He came in and grabbed me and started choking me and he told me if I screamed, he would kill me. Melinda had just turned 19. Watts tied up Aguilar and her roommate and began filling the bathtub with water. She also said, he was excited and hyper and clapping and just making noises like he was excited that this was going to be fun. She had no doubt that Watts was going to kill her. He clapped and jumped at one time and that's when I knew I had to do something. As Watts tried to drown her roommate in the bathtub, Aguilar managed to escape, throwing herself off of the second floor balcony. Neighbors called the police. The roommate was saved and Watts, a 28-year-old bus mechanic, was arrested as he tried to flee. While in custody, police began to link Watts with the recent murders of a number of women. Until early 1981, he had lived in Michigan, where authorities suspected him of being responsible for the murders of at least 10 women and girls there. Watts had previously been questioned about the murders in 1975, but there had not been enough evidence to convict him. At that time, Watts had spent a year in prison for attacking women who survived. Prosecutors in Texas did not feel they have enough evidence to convict Watts of murder. So in 1982, they arranged a plea bargain. If Watts gave full details and confessions to his crimes, they would give him immunity for the murder charges and he would instead face just a charge of burglary with intent to murder. This charge carried a 60-year sentence. He agreed with the deal and promptly confessed in detail to 12 murders in Texas. However, Michigan authorities refused to go in on the deal, so the cases in that state remained open. Watts later claimed that he had killed 40 women and has also implied that there were more than 80 victims in total. He would not confess outright to having committed these murders, however, because he did not want to be seen as a mass murderer. Police still consider Watts a suspect in 90 unsolved murders. Watts was sentenced to the agreed 60 years. However, shortly after he began serving time, the Texas Court of Appeals ruled that he had not been informed that the bathtub and water he attempted to drown Lori Lister in was considered a deadly weapon. The ruling reclassified him as a non-violent felon, making him eligible for early release. At the time, Texas law allowed non-violent felons to have three days deducted from their sentences for every one day served, as long as they were well behaved. Watts was a model prisoner and had enough time deducted from his sentence that he could have been released as early as May 9th, 2006. The law allowing early release was abolished after public outcry 
but could not be applied retroactively according to the Texas Constitution. In 2004, Michigan Attorney General Mike Cox went on national TV asking anyone to come forward with information in order to try and convict Watts of murder to ensure he was not released. Joseph Foy of Westland, Michigan came forward to say that he had seen a man fitting Watts' description murder Helen Dutcher, a 36-year-old woman who died after being stabbed 12 times in December 1979. Foy identified Watts by his eyes, which he described as being evil and devoid of emotion. Although Watts had immunity from prosecution for the 12 killings he admitted to in Texas, he had no immunity agreement in Michigan. Before his 2004 trial, law enforcement officials asked the trial judge to allow the Texas confessions into evidence, which he agreed to. Watts was promptly charged with the murder of Helen Dutcher. A Michigan jury convicted him on November 17, 2004, after hearing eyewitness testimony from Joseph Foy. On December 7, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. Two days later, authorities in Michigan started making moves to try him for the murder of Western Michigan University student Gloria Steele, who was stabbed to death in 1974. Watts' trial for the Steele murder began in Kalamazoo, Michigan on July 25, 2007. Closing arguments concluded on July 26. The following day, the jury returned a guilty verdict. Watts was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole on September 13. He was incarcerated at a maximum security prison in Ionia, Michigan. He died of prostate cancer on September 21st in a Jackson, Michigan hospital. Well, I think we all learned something new, didn't we? Mainly to watch your back because people are the scariest monsters of all. See you next time. Welcome back to another Serial Killer Saturday. Today's Man of the Hour was a requested one. Peter Curtin, also known as the Vampire of Dusseldorf. Curtin was convicted of nine murders, though he was suspected of committing up to 68. His victims were mainly women and girls. His motivation was sexual sadism, which can be traced back to his childhood. Curtin was the eldest of 13 children. Born in 1883, his childhood was one of unremitting poverty and violence. The Curtin family rented a one-bedroom apartment and lived in fear of Peter's father, a molder by trade, a habitual drunkard. He would return home from the local inn, beat his children, Peter as the eldest felt the brunt of the violence, and then rape his wife in front of them. In later years, he also sexually assaulted his daughters. 19th century Germany was no place for a battered wife, and Peter's mother was forced to endure her violent marriage in silence. Subjected to this daily routine of violence, Peter became twisted and formed an unhealthy friendship with a dog catcher who lived in the same building. At the age of nine, Peter pushed a friend off a raft as they played in the River Rhine. When another boy jumped in to try and help the drowning youngster, Peter held him under the water until he suffocated. The death of the two boys was attributed to an accident, and Peter was cleared of any blame. Curtin ran away from home at the age of 16, and shortly afterward, 
His father was jailed for three years after being convicted of incest with Peter's 13-year-old sister. Peter lived by his wits and often stole food and clothing to survive. He would be in and out of jail for the next 24 years and claimed his brutal treatment in the penal system made him hellbent on wreaking revenge on society. A charming, handsome, and when money allowed it, dapper young man. Curtin did not have trouble attracting women, but his violent lust and complete lack of empathy or normal human emotions meant that he was incapable of falling in love. In May of 1913, not long after being released from prison again, he was prowling the streets of Cologne, looking for somewhere to rob. Above an inn, he found a young girl asleep in her bed. When the body of 10-year-old Christine Klein was found the next morning, suspicion fell on her uncle, Otto, who had argued with the girl's father the night before and threatened to do something he would remember all his life. Otto was charged with the murder, but fortunately acquitted by a jury, which decided there was insufficient evidence. The identity of Christine's killer would not become clear for another 18 years. In 1914, with war clouds growing over Europe, Curtin was called up into the Kaiser's army. But military life did not suit the self-centered and ill-disciplined Curtin, and he soon deserted. He was caught and sent to jail, and would remain there throughout the war and its aftermath. Curtin spent much of his time in solitary confinement. He would often deliberately infringe rules so he could be locked up alone and would spend his time amid violent fantasies. He would imagine attacking people, setting fires, and even sabotaging railways in order to kill as many people as possible. On his release in 1921, he went to stay with his sister in the small town of Altenburg. There he met his future wife, a former prostitute who herself had spent four years in jail for shooting a man who had jilted her at the altar. She was eaten up by guilt and spent the rest of her life convinced that she must accept her fate to gain redemption for her sins. Eventually they wed and lived in Altenburg until 1925. With Curtin gaining employment in a factory as a molder, he also became an active trade unionist. The couple moved to Dusseldorf to find work and Curtin gradually found his self-control eroding. Between 1925 and 1928, he attacked four women in Dusseldorf, strangling them to the point of unconsciousness, often during sex. He also took up arson and would derive sexual satisfaction from imagining that a tramp was burning alive in a barn that he had just torched. Then on the night of February 9, 1929, he waylaid an eight-year-old girl, Rosa Oliger, as she walked down a Dusseldorf street. She was stabbed three times and found under a hedge. Curtin, who had tried to set fire to the body with petrol, later recalled having an orgasm at the height of the attack. The murder of Rosa Oliger was only the start of a stream of attacks on women, girls, and occasionally men in and around Dusseldorf. Some, such as Maria Kuhn, survived. She was stabbed 24 times. The reign of terror lasted throughout 1929 and into 1930, and the panic and outrage grew in the Dusseldorf area as each crime was luridly recounted in the German newspapers, with references to monsters and vampires. One of the most horrendous crimes occurred on August 23, 1929, as people in town were celebrating an annual affair. Curtin approached two foster sisters as they left the fair and asked the older one, Louise Lenzen, 14, to run an errand for him. Would you be very kind and get some cigarettes for me? I'll look after the little girl, he said. Louise agreed. But as soon as she was out of sight, he strangled five-year-old Gertrude Hamaker and slit her throat. When Louise returned, she too was dragged off the path, strangled 
and almost decapitated with Curtin's pocket knife. The attacks, many of them fatal, continued throughout the summer and autumn of 1929. On November 7th, after killing five-year-old Gertrude Alberman, Curtin sent a map to local newspapers showing where her body could be found under a pile of builder's debris. She had been strangled and stabbed 35 times. German police had a few clues to go on. Those who had survived the attacks were only able to give a basic description of a tall white man, which could have fitted half the residents of Dusseldorf. Curtin continued his onslaught throughout the winter and spring of 1930, but unfortunately, he did not claim any more lives. Then on May 14th of 1930, an unemployed domestic servant called Maria Budlick arrived in Dusseldorf from Cologne looking for work. The Great Depression had hit Germany particularly hard, and millions were jobless. She met a man who offered to show her the way to a boarding house where she could stay the night. But when he tried to show her a shortcut through the park, she became worried, and, remembering the newspaper stories about the vampire of Dusseldorf, began arguing and making her excuses. Suddenly, a second man intervened on her behalf and rescued her from the first man. Maria told the man she was out of work and had nowhere to go, and he offered to put her up in his apartment. He did not introduce himself, but his name was Peter Curtin. He took her back to his apartment. His wife was away for the night, and he tried to have sex with her, but she demurred, and he agreed to find her somewhere else to stay. They got a tram, and he then led her into the woods. It was there that Curtin grabbed her by the neck and raped her before leading her back to the tram and letting her go free. Asked later why he had not killed her, he said, I had no intention of killing her, as she offered no resistance. I also did not think that Budlick would be able to find her way back to my apartment, but Maria remembered the street name and Curtin's apartment vividly. Deeply traumatized and ashamed of the stigma of being a rape victim, she did not go to the police, but wrote a letter to a friend telling her of the experience. By chance, the letter was misdirected and was opened by a woman, who immediately took it to the police. Detectives traced Maria Budlick and persuaded her to give a full account of the incident. Eventually, she led officers back to 71 Met Manor Straws and saw Curtin on the stairs. She was too terrified to point him out, even in the presence of so many officers, and by the time she did open her mouth, he had packed a bag and fled. Curtin moved into an apartment nearby and told his wife what had happened with Maria Budlick. He told her he would be sent to jail for many years and she would be without his earnings and would be destitute. Curtin recalled later, she raved that I should take my life. Then she would do the same, since her future was completely without hope. But he came up with a plan. He confessed to her that he was the vampire of Dusseldorf and said she should take advantage to obtain the large reward being offered for information leading to his capture. She eventually agreed. Curtin had planned to carry out one more spectacular attack before his capture but his wife went immediately to the police, and when he met her again, as arranged, police armed with revolvers surrounded him. Curtin freely confessed to his crimes, and indeed relished going into great detail, and seeing police officers and stenographers wincing and grimacing at his horrors. He had relived his crimes many times over in his mind, and had almost photographic memory, so much so, that he could recall tiny details of Christine Klein's bedroom from 17 years before. Curtin went on trial in April of 1931, and he initially withdrew his confession and pleaded not guilty. But he later changed his mind. Under questioning by the examining magistrate, and was eventually convicted of nine murders and sentenced to death. On the night before his execution, his last meal was wiener schnitzel, fried potatoes, and white wine. At 6 a.m. on July 2nd, 
of 1931, despite protests by the German Humanitarian League, he was led to the guillotine and beheaded. The nightmare was over. Shortly before he was executed by guillotine, Peter Curtin, the so-called vampire of Dusseldorf, asked the psychiatrist, Tell me, after my head has been chopped off, will I still be able to hear, at least for a moment, the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my neck? When the doctor replied that his ears and brain probably would function for several seconds after the blade struck, Curtin replied, That would be the pleasure to end all pleasures. It seems obvious what drove Peter to become a sadistic rapist and killer. However, why then were not all of his siblings murderers as well? How was it that only his young mind absorbed and morphed into something so dark that he would turn into a monster and the rest of his siblings simply victims of their upbringing? If you figure it out, let me know. See you next time. Welcome back to another Serial Killer Saturday. Before we get started today, I want to talk to you all real quick and let you know that although I won't be getting rid of Serial Killer Saturday, I am only going to be doing Serial Killer Saturday once a month and adding other featurettes. This is for two reasons. Number one, I don't prefer to feature the same serial killers that everyone else on the planet has featured. I do look very hard and try and show you something new and fresh. The second reason, it honestly gets a bit difficult to look into the eyes of a killer as I make the videos, and then to see or hear about all of the horrible things they did takes a toll. Again, I'm not getting rid of it. I'm just branching out a bit and will still go out of my way to entertain and inform you. Andrei Romanovich Chikatilu, aka the Butcher of Rostov, the Red Ripper, the Rostov Ripper. He had no age or gender preference. His only preference was the thrill of the fear from his victims. Born in 1936 in a small Ukrainian farming village, at the age of five, his mother told Andre that seven years earlier his older brother Stefan had disappeared and the family believed that he had been kidnapped and eaten by neighbors. This story had a profound effect on the boy who later admitted that he often imagined what had been done to his brother. In 1945, Chikatilo's father, Roman, was conscripted into the army. Captured by the Germans, he did not return home until well after the war when he was branded by the Stalinists' regime as a traitor for allowing himself to be caught. Even though Andre was only 10 when his father returned, he was already a devout communist and openly criticized his father for his betrayal. At the age of 16, he was the editor of the school newspaper and the political information officer. At the age of 18, Chikatilo applied to Moscow University to study law. He failed the entrance exam, but blamed his rejection on his father's humiliating war record. As he matured, he became more confident with women, but several early attempts at sex failed when he was unable to achieve an erection. Convinced that he was impotent, he became obsessed with masturbation. 1957 through 1960, sometime in there while on national service, he attempted to have sex with a woman who was not interested in his advances. The woman struggled. Chikatilo overpowered her, only to release her shortly after when he realized that he had ejaculated inside his pants. Inadvertently, he had discovered that fear and violence excited him more than the sexual act itself. 
In 1960, he moved to Russia in search of work. He quickly found a job as a telephone engineer in a small town just north of Rostov. When he had saved enough money, he sent for his parents and his sister and moved them into his new home. In 1962, his sister introduced him to a woman named Feyina, and a year later they were married. Feyina quickly learned that her new husband was not only unable to consummate the marriage, but he had no real interest in sex. She saw this as nothing more than intense shyness and finally managed to coax him into having intercourse with her, and eventually they had two children. In 1965, his first child was born, a girl. In 69, their second child, a boy. 1970, Chikatilyu successfully enrolled in a correspondence course with Rostov Liberal Arts University. And in 1971, Chikatilyu gained degrees in Russian literature, engineering, and Marxism and Leninism. With his newfound skills, Chikatilyu became a teacher at a vocational school, number 32. Almost from the beginning, his teaching career was a disaster. His abject shyness made it almost impossible for him to teach or control his pupils. He was constantly humiliated and ridiculed, not only by his students, but also by other staff members who considered him odd. Despite his lack of success, Chikatilyu stayed in his teaching job. He later admitted that he found the company of young children sexually aroused him. In the following years, what began as simple voyeurism outside the school toilets had degenerated into indecent assaults on both male and female students. The students' parents began to complain. Chikatilyu was forced to resign and move on to other schools. At one such school, Chikatilyu was put in charge of a boy's dormitory. As usual, his charges ignored him or openly teased him. It was at this point that Chikatilyu was caught trying to fillet a sleeping boy. He was attacked and beaten by several senior students. From that moment on, Chikatilyu carried a knife. In 1978, Chikatilyu moved his family to Shakti. Later that year in December on the 22nd, Chikatilyu killed a nine-year-old girl. She was his first victim, and her body was found two days later in the Groshovka River. The police called Chikatilyu in for questioning, but released him shortly after when his wife confirmed the story that he had been home with her the entire evening. Even though the evidence against Chikatilyu was strong, police arrested another person named Alexander Kravchenko, a local man who had previously served six years of a 10-year prison sentence for the rape and murder of a 17-year-old girl in 1970. The police managed to obtain a confession from him. After a short trial, Kravchenko was found guilty of the murder and sentenced to 15 years in a labor camp. Hearing the verdict, the people of Shakti lodged an official complaint against the leniency of the sentence. A new judge appointed to investigate the complaint upheld the public appeal and passed a death sentence on to Kravchenko. After being cleared of the murder, Chikatilyu continued teaching until he was made redundant in 1981. Unable to get another teaching job, he found employment as a supply clerk for a local industrial complex. The job entailed travel to other parts of the country to locate and purchase supplies for the factory. He found that the periods away from home gave him ample time to search for new victims. In September of 1981, Chikatilyu kills his second known victim, a 17-year-old. In 
Her body was found the next day. Chikatuyu was elated. While his first victim had left him frustrated and confused, the second had given him an appetite that he found hard to satisfy. In June of 1982, while on another business trip, he killed a 13-year-old girl after following her from a bus stop. After a failed attempt at rape, he produced a knife and stabbed her repeatedly, including several wounds to her eyes. Because of the warm summer conditions, her body was almost a skeleton when it was found two weeks later. Between July and December of 1982, Chikatuyu kills a 14-year-old girl, a 9-year-old girl, 16-year-old girl, a 9-year-old boy, a 15-year-old boy, and a 10-year-old girl. Chikatuyu, shy and impotent, quickly learned how to choose his victims carefully. His travels took him to many railway and bus stations, where he was able to coerce young vagrants of both sexes to go with him. Mostly, it was a promise of food or similar treats that lured them into the isolated tracts of forest that bordered most Russian towns. On some occasions, the victims offered sexual favors in advance. Either way, once they went with him, they were doomed. An added advantage of preying on vagrants in Russia was that nobody reported them missing because officially, they did not exist. They only became known when their bodies were found. Between June and December of 1983, Shikatuyu kills a 15-year-old girl, a 13-year-old girl, a 24-year-old woman, a 7-year-old boy, 22-year-old woman, an 18-year-old girl, a 19-year-old girl, and a 14-year-old boy. By the end of 1983, the total number of victims had risen to 17, of which six had been found. The Central Moscow Militia, concerned by the number of dead children that were being reported by the local police, sent Major Fedezov and his team to Rostov to take over the investigation. Soon after his arrival, Fedezov reviewed the situation and sent a scathing report to his superiors in Moscow, criticizing the ineptitude of the local police and suggesting that all six murders were the work of a single sex-crazed killer. Moscow headquarters reluctantly accepted his findings, but fell short of calling the perpetrator a serial killer, as that was seen to be purely Western phenomenon and not possible in Russian culture. By 1984, as most of the bodies had been recovered from the woodlands, the case was known unofficially as the Lesopolosa or the Forest Strip Killings. Samples of semen taken from the victims indicated that the killer had a type AB blood. If any of the suspects matched, they were detained for further questioning. Those that didn't were released. In the absence of computers, the details of all of the suspects interviewed were handwritten on index cards and kept in boxes. One of the cards recorded that Chikatuyu had been interviewed, but was released when his blood type failed to provide a match. At this point, the murders were accelerating at an alarming rate. From January to September, 15 new murders had been committed, 11 of them during the summer period alone. In January of 1984, Chikatuyu kills a 17-year-old girl, a 44-year-old woman, and a 10-year-old boy. For the first time, the police found evidence about the murderer, a footprint. In May of 1984, a double murder. Chikatuyu kills a former mistress of his. She was 32, as well as her daughter who was 11. June through September 
of 1984. Chikatuyu kills a 22-year-old girl, 13-year-old boy, 19-year-old girl, 20-year-old girl, 16-year-old girl, 17-year-old girl, an unknown woman, a 12-year-old girl, an 11-year-old boy, and a 24-year-old girl. September 14th, 1984. Chikatuyu is under arrest. As his history unfolded, police learned of his penchant for children, particularly girls. They uncovered the classroom incidents, his acts of voyeurism, and the sexual assault of the boy in the dormitory. Several people who lived in the vicinity of his secret shack reported that he had used it to entertain prostitutes and spoke of his habit of stalking the corridors of trains. The evidence seemed to indicate that he could be the killer they sought until a blood sample was taken from him and analyzed. His blood type was found to be type A. Had they taken samples of his sperm, hair, or saliva, they would have found that his blood type was actually type AB, as the B antigens are not present in the blood in sufficient quantities to provide a positive match. The only real evidence they had left were the contents of his briefcase and the police report of his activities at the train stations. Incredibly, the knife and other items were lost when a local police lieutenant mistakenly returned them to Chikatuyu's home. Having insufficient evidence to charge him for the murders, he was later charged with the stealing offenses and sentenced to one year's imprisonment and expelled from the Communist Party. December 12th, 1984. After serving just three months of his original sentence, he was released. December 1984. After celebrating the new year with his family, Chikatuyu sought out a new job and was soon employed in a locomotive factory. And, as before, his new job entailed travel. 1985. The director of Moscow's Department for Violent Crime, unofficially called the Killer Department, takes over the case and reorganized his investigators into three teams. One group concentrated on Shakti, another on Rostov, and the third on Novoshaktinsk. His strategy was simple. Investigate each murder systematically and focus on the area surrounding each one. August 1985. During a business trip to Moscow, Chikatilyu kills an 18-year-old girl. Later that same month, Chikatilyu kills another 18-year-old girl. December 1985. Authorities organized for all trains in the three districts to be patrolled by plain-clothed militia and the Druzhniki, as the volunteer militia were called. Their instructions were to stop and check the documents of anyone who looked suspicious. In addition, Army helicopters were used to patrol the railway lines and the adjoining forests from the air. This increased scrutiny may have been the reason why Chikatilyu ceased his activities for nearly two years. Whatever the reason, the investigators were later embarrassed to learn that Chikatilyu himself in his capacity as a freelance employer of the Department of Internal Affairs had been assisting the militia to patrol the trains looking for the killer. Armed with the knowledge that the investigation centered around only three areas, he resumed killing in areas far removed from them. 1986 Chikatuyu supposedly didn't kill in this year. He spent most of 1986 traveling around the country on buying trips for his employer and celebrated his 50th birthday. In May of 1987, during a trip to the town of Revda, Chikatiryu kills a 13-year-old boy. July 1987, during another trip to the Ukraine, 
Chikatuyu killed a 12-year-old boy. The attack was so brutal that a part of his knife blade broke off and was later found at the scene by police. September 1987 A trip to Leningrad in September resulted in the death of yet another boy, 16. April through July of 1988 Chikatuyu kills a 12-year-old girl, a 9-year-old boy, and a 15-year-old boy. In March of 1989, Chikatuyu kills a 16-year-old girl. The crime occurred at his daughter's apartment. It had been empty since the daughter had divorced her husband and moved back with her parents. After Chikatuyu lured the 16-year-old girl inside, he gave her vodka and seduced her. After stabbing and violating her body, he realized he could not leave her body at the house. Taking a kitchen knife, he decapitated her and sawed off her legs before wrapping her in rags and articles of clothing. He then tied the bundles to a sled belonging to a neighbor and dragged it through the streets to the area where he dumped her remains. In May of that same year, Chikatuyu kills an eight-year-old boy and in June, a 10-year-old boy. In August of 1989, Chikatuyu kills a 19-year-old girl. He killed her while he was on his way to his father's birthday party. Seeing a 19-year-old girl at a bus stop, he offered to walk her home, but instead lured her into the woods and stabbed her. After cutting out her uterus and slicing off part of her face, he wrapped the remains in her clothing and left for the party. August 1989 Chikatuyu kills another 10-year-old boy that he had met in a video shop. The boy died of multiple stab wounds and Chikatuyu buried him in Rostov Cemetery. When the police recovered the bodies, many of them were missing parts. Many females were missing their uterus and nipples and the males had genitals and occasionally tongues sliced or bitten off. Chikatuyu is believed to have made fires in the forest near where he murdered his victims, first boiling, then eating their genitals. He later revealed he did so because if you eat the genitals, your sexual ability gets better. In his last year of freedom, Chikatuyu killed eight more victims. January through August 1990, Chikatuyu kills an 11-year-old boy, 10-year-old boy, 30-year-old woman, 13-year-old boy, and an 11-year-old boy. In October of 1990, Chikatuyu kills a 16-year-old boy. His body was found in November near Rostov's railway station, a location that had been under heavy scrutiny for months. Ironically, the day it wasn't patrolled, owing to a manpower shortage, was the day that Chikatuyu struck. Later that same month, Chikatuyu kills another 16-year-old boy. November 6th, 1990. Chikatuyu kills a 20-year-old woman, she went with him to the woods near Lesbaz Station and was beaten, stabbed, and mutilated. Chikatuyu removed the tip of her tongue and both nipples and ate them at the scene before he covered her naked body with leaves and branches. As he returned to the station, he saw four women and a man standing on the platform. The man, Sergeant Rybakov, a policeman attached to the Forest Belt Task Force noticed Chikatuyu walking beside the platform, wiping sweat from his face. November 20th, 1990. Chikatuyu was at work as his bandaged finger, which had been bitten by one of his victims, was aching badly. He left work and went to a nearby clinic for x-rays. After receiving treatment for the finger, which was broken, he went home. 
shortly after he went out to buy beer. On the way, he attempted to talk to a young boy, but was scared off when a woman approached. He walked further until he met another boy that he engaged in conversation until the boy was called away by his mother. As he continued on, three men in leather jackets approached him and identified themselves as police officers. One of the men then handcuffed him and told him he was under arrest. He was then transported to the office of Mikhail Fedesov at the regional headquarters of the Department of Internal Affairs. Chikatiyu, who had made no attempt to resist the arrest, did not speak for the entire trip. When he was arrested, he had with him a briefcase containing a knife, a length of rope, and a jar of Vaseline. After a search of his apartment, police found 23 knives, a hammer, and a pair of shoes that were later found to match the footprint next to one of his victims. April 14, 1992 First day of Chikatiyu's trial October 15, Chikatiyu was found guilty of 52 counts of murder one charge having been dropped owing to insufficient evidence. In February of 1994, Chikatiyu was executed. Chikatiyu's Confession On November 29th, at the request of Burakov and Fedesov, Dr. Alexander Bukhanovsky, the psychiatrist who had written the 1985 psychological profile, of the then unknown killer for the investigators, was invited to assist in the questioning of the suspect. Bukhanovsky read extracts from his 65-page psychological profile to Chikatiyu. Within two hours, Chikatiyu confessed to 36 murders police had linked to the killer. Chikatiyu confessed to a further 20 killings, which had not been connected to the case either because the murders had been committed outside the Rostov Oblast, because the bodies had not been found, or, in the case of his first murder, because an innocent man had been convicted and executed for the murder. In December of 1990, Chikatuyu led police to the body of a boy he had confessed to killing in 1989, and whom he had buried in woodland near a Shakti cemetery, proving unequivocally he was the killer. He later led investigators to the bodies of two other victims he had confessed to killing. Three of the 56 victims Chikatiyu confessed to killing could not be found or identified. But Chikatiyu was charged with killing 53 women and children between 1978 and 1990. On August 20th, 1991, after completing the interrogation of Chikatiyu and having completed a reenactment of all of the murders at each crime scene, Chikatiyu was transferred to the Serbsky Institute in Moscow for a six day psychiatric evaluation to determine whether he was mentally competent to stand trial. Chikatiyu was analyzed by a senior psychiatrist who declared him legally sane in October. In December of 1991, details of Chikatiyu's arrest and a brief summary of his crimes were released to the newly liberated media by police. The trial of Chikatiyu was the first major event of post-Soviet Russia. Chikatiyu stood trial in Rostov on April 14, 1992. During the trial, he was kept in an iron cage in a corner of the courtroom to protect him from attack by the many hysterical and enraged relatives of his victims. Chikatiyu's head had been shaven, a standard prison precaution against the lights. Relatives of the victims regularly shouted threats and insults to Chikatiyu during the trial, demanding that authorities release him 
so they could kill him themselves. Each murder was discussed individually, and on several occasions, relatives broke down in tears when details of their relative's murder were released. Many fainted. Chikatuyu regularly interrupted the trial, exposing himself, singing, and refusing to answer questions put to him by the judge. He was regularly removed from the courtroom for interrupting the proceedings. On May 13th, Chikatuyu withdrew his confessions to six of the killings to which he had previously confessed. In July of 1992, Chikatuyu demanded that the judge be replaced for making too many rash remarks about his guilt. His defense counsel backed the claim. The judge looked to the prosecutor, and even the prosecutor backed the defense's judgment, stating that the judge had indeed made too many such remarks. The judge ruled the prosecutor be replaced instead. On August 9th, both prosecution and defense delivered their final arguments before the judge. Chikatuyu again attempted to interrupt the proceedings and had to be removed from the courtroom. Final sentencing was postponed until October 14th. As the final deliberations began, the brother of a victim, a 17-year-old girl killed by Chikatuyu in August 1984, threw a heavy chunk of metal at Chikatuyu, hitting him in the chest. When security tried to arrest the young man, other victims' relatives shielded him, preventing him from being arrested. On October 14th, the court reconvened, and the judge read the list of murders again, not finishing until the following day. On October 15th, Chikatuyu was found guilty of 52 of the 53 murders and sentenced to death for each offense. Chikatuyu kicked his bench across his cage when he heard the verdict and began shouting abuse. He was offered a final chance to make a speech in response to the verdict, but remained silent. Upon passing final sentence, the judge made the following speech. Taking into consideration the monstrous crimes he committed, this court has no alternative but to impose the only sentence that he deserves. I therefore sentence him to death. On January 4th, 1994, Russian President Boris Yeltsin refused a last-ditch appeal for clemency. On February 14th, Chikatuyu was taken to a soundproof room in Novochurkask prison and executed by a single gunshot behind the right ear. Well, I wonder who the lucky person was. I would imagine there was a lineup, starting with the families of his many victims. Chikatuyu went out of his way to act like a fool in his cell slash cage in the courtroom during his trial. No doubt so that he would be deemed insane. All the while, offering no apologies or showing any remorse. I would rightfully argue that his actions before he was caught and after would not constitute the mindset of a sane man. Monsters walk among us every day, and unfortunately they don't wear a sign telling us what they are. This case has inspired one of the new Saturday featurettes to be psychological disorders and conditions, perhaps allowing us to delve deeper into the mind of a killer. Because after all, if you treat the disease, you avoid the end result, death. If you have a serial killer you would like to see featured here, please contact me through any of my social media links or leave a comment here. See you next time. It's Brittany, bitch. Not. <laughs>
Welcome back to another Serial Killer Saturday. This video is beyond graphic and disturbing, but aren't they all? Today, we are focusing on the killer who inspired several fictional serial killers, including Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Norman Bates from Psycho, and Buffalo Bill from The Silence of the Lambs. Edward Theodore Gain, also known as the Plainfield Ghoul, a necrophiliac. And if you don't know what that is, I highly suggest you pause this and Google it. He murdered his known victims by shooting. Although he was arraigned for murdering 11 and charged for only two, the amount of remains and method of how he went about decorating his home would no doubt allow anyone to speculate that the real number will never be known. Ed Gein was born on August 27, 1906, to Augusta and George, in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Eddie was the second of two boys. The firstborn was Henry, who was seven years older than Eddie. Their mother, a fanatically religious woman, was determined to raise the boys according to her strict moral code. Sinners inhabited Augusta's world, and she instilled in her boys the teachings of the Bible on a daily basis. She repeatedly warned her sons of the immorality and looseness of women, hoping to discourage any sexual desires the boys might have had, for fear of them being cast down into hell. Augusta was a domineering and hard woman, who believed her views of the world were absolute and true. She had no difficulty forcefully imposing her beliefs on her sons and husband. George, a weak man and alcoholic, had no say in the raising of the boys. In fact, Augusta despised him and saw him as a worthless creature not fit to hold down a job, let alone care for their children. She took it upon herself to not only raise the children according to her beliefs, but also to provide for the family financially. She began a grocery business in La Crosse the year Eddie was born, which brought in a fair amount of money to support the family in a comfortable fashion. She worked hard and saved money so that the family could move to a more rural area away from the immorality of the city and the sinners that inhabited it. In 1914, they moved to Plainfield, Wisconsin to a 195-acre farm. Isolated from any evil influences that could disrupt her family. The closest neighbors were almost a quarter of a mile away. Though Augusta tried diligently to keep her sons away from the outside world, she was not entirely successful because it was necessary for the boys to attend school. Eddie's performance in school was average, although he excelled in reading. It was the reading of adventure books and magazines that stimulated Eddie's imagination and allowed him to momentarily escape into his own world. His schoolmates shunned Eddie because he was effeminate and shy. He had no friends, and when he attempted to make them, his mother scolded him. Although his mother's opposition to making friends saddened Eddie, he saw her as the epitome of goodness and followed her rigid orders the best he could. Augusta was rarely pleased with her boys, and she often verbally abused them, believing that they were destined to become failures like their father. During their teens and throughout their early adulthood, the boys remained detached from people outside of their farmstead and had only the company of each other. Eddie looked up to his brother Henry and saw him as a hard worker and a man of strong character. After the death of their father in 1940, 
they took on a series of odd jobs to help financially support the farm and their mother. Eddie tried to emulate his brother's work habits, and they both were considered by townspeople to be reliable and trustworthy. They worked as handymen mostly, yet Eddie frequently babysat for neighbors. It was babysitting that Eddie really enjoyed, because children were easier for him to relate to than his peers. He was in many ways, socially and emotionally, underdeveloped and delayed. Henry was worried about Eddie's unhealthy attachment to their mother. On several occasions, Henry openly criticized their mother, something that shocked Eddie. Eddie saw his mother as pure goodness and was mortified that his brother did not see her in the same way. It was possible these incidents led to the untimely and mysterious death of Henry in 1944. On May 16th, Eddie and Henry were fighting a brush fire that was burning dangerously close to their farm. According to police, the two separated in different directions, attempting to put out the blaze. During their struggle, night quickly approached, and soon Eddie lost sight of Henry. After the blaze was extinguished, Eddie supposedly became worried about his missing brother and contacted the police. The police then organized a search party and were surprised upon reaching the farm to have Eddie lead them directly to the missing Henry, who was lying dead on the ground. The police were concerned about some of the things surrounding Henry's death. For example, Henry was lying on a piece of earth that was untouched by fire, and he had bruises on his head. Although Henry was found under strange circumstances, police were quick to dismiss foul play. No one would believe that shy Eddie was capable of killing anyone, especially his brother. Later, the county coroner would list asphyxiation as the cause of death. The only living person Eddie had left was his mother, and that was the only person he needed. However, he would have his mother all to himself for a very brief period. On December 29, 1945, Augusta died after a series of strokes. Eddie's foundations were shaken upon her death. Eddie lost his only friend and one true love, and he was absolutely alone in the world. He remained at the farm after his mother's death and lived off the meager earnings from odd jobs that he performed. Eddie boarded off the rooms his mother used most, mainly the upstairs floor, the downstairs parlor, and living room. He preserved them as a shrine to her and left them untouched for the years to follow. He resided in the lower level of the house, making use of the kitchen area and a small room located just off the kitchen, which he used as a bedroom. It was in these areas that Eddie would spend his spare time reading death cult magazines and adventure stories. At other times, Eddie would immerse himself in his bizarre hobbies that included nightly visits to the graveyard. After the death of his mother, Eddie became increasingly lonely. He spent much of his spare time reading pulp magazines and anatomy books. The rooms he inhabited were full of periodicals about Nazis, South Sea headhunters, and shipwrecks. From his readings, Eddie learned about the process of shrinking heads, exhuming corpses from graves, and the anatomy of the human body. He became obsessed with these weird stories, and he would often recount some of them to the children he babysat. Eddie also enjoyed reading the local newspapers. His favorite section was the obituaries. It was from the obituaries that Eddie would learn of the recent deaths of local women, 
having never enjoyed the company of the opposite sex, he would quench his lust by visiting graves at night. Although he later swore to police that he never had sexual intercourse with any of the dead women he had exhumed because they smelled too bad. He did, however, take a particular pleasure in peeling their skin from their bodies and wearing it. He was curious to know what it was like to have breasts and a vagina, and he often dreamed of being a woman. He was fascinated with women because of the power and hold they had over men. He acquired quite a collection of body parts, some of which included preserved heads. On one occasion, a young boy that he sometimes looked after visited Eddie's farm. He later said that Eddie had showed him human heads that he kept in his bedroom, and Eddie claimed the shriveled heads were from the South Seas, relics from headhunters. When the young boy told people of his experience, his story was quickly dismissed as a figment of a young boy's imagination. Then, somewhat later, the boy was vindicated when two other young men paid a visit to Ed Gaines' farm. They too had seen the preserved heads of women, but thought them to be just strange Halloween costumes. Rumors began to circulate and soon most of the townspeople were gossiping about the strange objects Eddie supposedly possessed. However, no one took the story seriously until Bernice Warden disappeared years later. In fact, people would often joke with Eddie about having shrunken heads and Eddie would just smile or make reference to having them in his room. No one thought he was telling the truth, or maybe they just didn't want to believe it was true. During the late 1940s and 1950s, Wisconsin police began to notice an increase in missing persons cases. There were four cases that baffled police. The first was that of an eight-year-old girl named Georgia Weckler, who had disappeared coming home from school on May 1st, 1947. Hundreds of residents and police searched an area of 10 square miles of Jefferson, Wisconsin, hoping to find the young girl. Unfortunately, Georgia would never be seen or heard of again. There were no good suspects, and the only evidence police had to go on were tire marks found near the place where Georgia was last seen. The tire marks were that of a Ford. The case remained unsolved and wouldn't be open again until years later when Ed Gein was convicted of murder. Another girl disappeared six years later in La Crosse. 15-year-old Evelyn Hartley had been babysitting at the time she had vanished. Evelyn's father repeatedly tried to phone the girl at the house where she was babysitting, and there was no answer. Worried, the girl's father immediately drove to where she was babysitting. No one answered the door. When he peered through a window, he could see one of his daughter's shoes and a pair of her eyeglasses on the floor. He tried to enter the house, but all the doors and windows were locked, except for one, the back basement window. It was at that window where he discovered bloodstains. Petrified, he entered the house and discovered signs of a struggle. Immediately, he contacted the police. When they arrived at the house, they found more evidence of a struggle, including bloodstains on the grass leading away from the house, a bloody handprint on a neighboring house, footprints, and the girl's other shoe on the basement floor. A regional search was conducted, but Evelyn was nowhere to be found. A few days later, police discovered some bloodied articles of clothing that belonged to Evelyn near a highway outside of La Crosse. The worst was suspected. In November of 1952, two men stopped for a drink at a bar in Plainfield, Wisconsin, before heading out to hunt deer. Victor Travis 
and Ray Burgess spent several hours at the bar before leaving. The two men and their car were never to be seen again. A massive search was conducted, but there was no trace of them. They had simply vanished. On November 16, 1957, hardware store owner Bernice Warden disappeared, and police had reason to suspect Gein. Warden's son had told investigators that Gein had been in the store that evening before the disappearance, saying he would return the following morning for a gallon of antifreeze. A sales slip for a gallon of antifreeze was the last receipt written by Warden on the morning she disappeared. Upon searching Gein's property, investigators discovered Warden's decapitated body in a shed, hung upside down by ropes at her wrists, with a crossbar at her ankles. The torso was dressed out like that of a deer. She had been shot with a 22 caliber rifle, and the mutilations performed at her death. On November 17, 1957, after the discovery of Bernice Warden's headless corpse and other gruesome artifacts in Eddie's house, police began an exhaustive search of the remaining parts of the farm and surrounding land. They believed Eddie may have been involved in more murders and that the bodies might be buried on his land. While searching the house, authorities found the following. Four noses, whole human bones and fragments, nine masks of human skin, bulls made from human skulls, ten female heads with the tops sawed off, human skin covering several chair seats, Mary Hogan's head in a paper bag, Bernice Warden's head in a burlap sack, nine vulvas in a shoebox, skulls on his bedposts, organs in the refrigerator, a pair of lips on a drawstring for a window shade, a belt made from human female nipples, a lampshade made from the skin of a human face. These artifacts were photographed at the crime lab and then were properly destroyed. While excavations began at the farmstead, Eddie was being interviewed at Watoma County Jailhouse by investigators. Gain at first did not admit to any of the killings. However, after more than a day of silence, he began to tell the horrible story of how he killed Mrs. Warden and where he acquired the body parts.